Hello and welcome back. So after several polite requests and one somewhat hostile demand, you know who you are, I have decided to complete the ASLS cheat sheet. So this video starts out the same way that the other ones do that are in this vein. Read the book. There's a lot of good information in there. I'm going to share some good information with you today that is absolutely essential to uh, understanding the class, but you also need to read the book. Buy the book, read the book, and then go to the class. So stroke exams, let's jump right in. There's several types of stroke exams out there. The MEND exam is rapidly becoming the standard in many places. Um, no single stroke scale has ever been proven to be better or worse objectively. So there's a lot of personal feelings about it, but objectively they can't prove one's any better than the other. The MEND is really a combination of the Cincinnati and the NIH. So they kind of took the best parts of both of those and put them together to make the MEND. Um, it requires no additional tools, and the full thing can be done in about three minutes. Uh, the faster versions of it, which are done kind of pre-CT or in pre-hospital, uh, can be done in just a couple of seconds. I put a source down here at the bottom if you want to read more about um, this stroke exam so you can kind of understand if it's something you want to use or not. Uh, it definitely is w one of the best ones out there. So types of strokes. Uh, the ischemic stroke is going to be the most common. By far, 85% of strokes are a thromboembolus. That means a clot for all intents and purposes. Hemorrhagic makes up the last 15%, which is going to be bleeding in the brain. So anytime you have bleed in the brain, that's a hemorrhagic stroke, brain hemorrhage, etc. This sort of third category off to the side is going to be the TIA, and that's a thromboembolism. So um, when a TIA happens, there's this transient ischemic attack, this transient ischemia. Uh, no infarct happens. There's not a lot of injury associated with it, and the signs and symptoms resolve spontaneously within 24 hours. And that's what makes it a TIA. So stroke syndromes are something you're going to have to know if you want to make it through this class. Uh, technically, there's a stroke syndrome for every named artery, and you can just break out your Gray's Anatomy books and go wild with that one. But there's, there's five basic ones that are the major stroke syndromes that we look for in the field. So, of course, you have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. You have the brain stem itself. You can have a cerebellum stroke, and then you can have a hemorrhagic stroke. So hemorrhagic is a very broad category for any time you have a bleed somewhere. Okay, um, be, be mindful of the fact that both of these can present with um, ipsilateral or contralateral paralysis or weakness when you're doing your field exam. Now, now what I mean by that, and I need to clarify, is that you can be moving towards a field diagnosis or something without a CT and you need to be prepared to see either one of these regardless of what you think it is. Of course, certain stroke syndromes have very specific signs and symptoms. We're going to cover a little bit more of that, but just kind of keep an open mind when you're suspecting a stroke and moving forward. Um, let's, you know, kind of elaborate on each one of these. The left hemisphere, you're going to have right visual field deficits. There's going to be leftward gaze deviation. This is due to the paralysis of the ocular muscles. There's going to be aphasia, uh, right hemiparesis, and then, of course, uh, sensory loss of the affected side. So just like you were taught in health class how the, the brain crosses over, so if you have a stroke in the left hemisphere of your brain, generally speaking, the right side of your body is going to be the affected side. You're going to lose sensory, you're going to lose motor, and then, of course, uh, the, the gaze is above the neck, so it's above the crossover, and that is why you're going to have that leftward gaze. So an old saying they used to say was that the uh, the gaze looks toward the side of the stroke, which is it's pretty good advice. Moving to the right hemisphere is going to be just the opposite. So left visual field deficit, right gaze deviation. You're going to have left hemi inattention, so some neglect there. Uh, hemiparesis on the left side, and of course left hemisensory loss. So um, same exact thing, just on the opposing side. The brain stems where it gets a little more complicated. So you can have quadriparesis where you can't really move much of anything. Um, complete sensory loss in all four limbs, um, which kind of goes along with the motor side of it if you really think about it. You can have uh, contralateral, contralateral symptoms of it as well. Uh, hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, decreased consciousness, nausea, vomiting, hiccups, abnormal respirations, right? Bias respirations. Uh, oropharyngeal uh, weakness, so an inability to speak, you have some of that dysarthria, inability to swallow, a lot can go wrong there. Um, vertigo and ringing in the ears, which is the tinnitus. And then, of course, eye movement abnormalities. Uh, diplopia is double vision, a disconjugate gaze, and, of course, gaze deviation. Any of this is possible with the brainstem, depending upon where exactly the zone of infarct is. A lot of that um, 
is what actually produces the symptoms, okay? The cerebellum stroke is one of the ones that's kind of picked up a little bit less in the pre-hospital realm because it is kind of a generalized uh, symptom. There, there are symptoms that when they present, you can be really sure that's, that's you know what you're dealing with. But there's also times when the illness can present and you don't have a lot of specific symptoms. So uh, some of the ones that they've really nailed down in ASLS is, of course, ipsilateral limb ataxia, right? So you're not coordinated with it. And then, of course, truncal or gait ataxia, which is one of the biggest ones because the cerebellum is our center of balance. So anytime you have someone who has a fairly normal gait and, you know, walking just fine one moment and then all of a sudden they sort of walk like a toddler would or have this wide gait as if they feel like they're unstable or on a rocking boat, it's a, it's a pretty good sign that they at least need to be evaluated for a cerebellum stroke. So let's move into the hemorrhage realm of things and then discuss the subarachnoid hemorrhage and the intracerebral hemorrhage. So the top bullets belong to the intracerebral hemorrhage, but please try and bear in mind that these symptoms can overlap. Okay, so um, headache is definitely one of the symptoms you're always going to see when there's a bleed in the brain. There's been a change in intracranial pressure, and of course the, the brain is going to respond to that. The meninges are going to send pain signals to respond to that. Um, blood irritates those meninges when you have... Um, blood anywhere outside of where it's supposed to be anytime it comes into contact with bodily tissues it's going to produce some amount of irritation so this is some of what we see in, in even cases of peritonitis and things like that in trauma um, often enough it can be blood that's causing that irritation so the same concept with the brain uh, can be going on with these a lot of these symptoms can actually overlap i'm gonna kind of say that again and just state it because it is um it's very difficult to nail down a specific stroke syndrome in the field or without a CT and a full neurological exam and all the tools it takes to do that. So um, just take a look at these symptoms. You can see kind of what's up here and just kind of bear in mind that most of them have to do with a bleed, but it's going to be very difficult for you to say this person is having an intracerebral hemorrhage in Wernicke's area of the brain. Um, doing nothing more than using a cardiac monitor and taking some vital signs and, and doing a MIND exam. That's just, it's not realistic to think that. So let's move forward to some different things that they cover in ASLS. Uh, hypoglycemia is fairly important because it mimics a stroke. And um, I, I can remember when I first heard this, I, you know, it was, it was just kind of weird to hear that, to think there could be hemiparesis and facial droop and all that stuff, but it absolutely can. Um, stroke alert should not be called until the patient is normoglycemic. So that's very important. Until you've got a normal blood glucose, um, which is to say they're not hypoglycemic, you can certainly call uh, stroke alerts with hyperglycemia. But anytime the, uh, the blood glucose is below 60 milligrams per deciliter, it's really not, uh, it's not applicable to stroke syndromes. It doesn't mean your patient's not having a stroke. It means these are tick boxes you need to make sure are Correct. So if you're going to administer D50, just be conservative with it. All you need is a blood glucose of 60, or in some places they want you to have a blood glucose of 70. For ALS purposes, it's going to be 60. So for uh, TPA, the eligibility for TPA is, is fairly important. Now, this is not something that's decided uh, outside in the field because individual physicians can absolutely uh, make their own determinations and either expand that criteria or limit it somewhat depending on how they feel about an individual patient's condition. But just kind of for your knowledge uh, for this class, um, they're eligible for TPA if the onset of the stroke was less than three to four and a half hours. So always make sure you're finding out exactly when the patient was last seen normal and they can kind of confirm that and nail it down. Ischemic stroke has to be present for TPA. We can't give a clot buster if it's not a clot. We certainly can't give it in a brain hemorrhage. Uh, and hemorrhage has to be excluded by CT scan. That's one very important part of this, which is why, you know, you're not going to be hanging a lot of, of TPA and stuff out in the field. It's just not going to happen. Ischemic stroke onset. Um, it looks like I've copied a bullet there. It'll be all right. It's uh, probably that important. So blood pressure needs to be under uh, 185 over 110. This changes from neurocenter to neurocenter. These are the Miami numbers. Um, there, It is different all over the country. So if you have a different protocol and you're watching this, believe me, I get it. It's different everywhere you go. Uh, and then, of course, no other contraindications. Um, so when are they specifically ineligible? What things do we have where we can say, okay, it is very unlikely this patient is going to get TPA under any circumstances? Uh, anytime someone is greater than 80 years old, it's unlikely. It has happened. It does happen, um, just not as commonly. 
um, if they're on any sort of oral anticoagulant, so if they take Plavix, if they take Warfarin or anything like that, uh, they may not be eligible for TPA. If they have a stroke score over 25, so the NIH stroke score, anytime it's over 25, there's a very high likelihood of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, so they're probably not going to get any sort of clot busting agent. Um, definitely not TPA. With um, blood glucose under 60, that kind of goes back to what we discussed earlier in hypoglycemia. You have to be sure that this is this is a stroke before you take the risk of giving a tissue plasminogen activator. Um, symptoms that are suggestive um, of subarachnoid hemorrhage is that's a difficult one to really clarify on. One thing that you'll want to keep in mind is if there's any suggestion, if there's any symptom that is consistent with hemorrhage until they've done everything to rule it out, they're definitely not going to give any sort of lytics like this because if you have even a small hemorrhage and you get these lytics, it's going to run wild and it is going to cause death. And that's not what we want. Um, anytime there's an, any active bleeding going on, that doesn't mean just in the head. That means anywhere. And then, of course, elevated blood pressure whenever um, you can't get it back down. So this, this bullet really should have said, you know, refractory elevated blood pressure or something. You can't get back down or you don't have the means to get it down. Uh, you cannot risk giving a lytic at that point. Um, any, any blood pressure is above about 180. You really start running the risk of any unknown aneurysms or weakened blood vessels um, just popping and hemorrhaging. Okay. So there are pediatric concerns with stroke as much as we hate that. One of the things you need to remember is that when you suspect a stroke syndrome in a pediatric patient, um, it is much more likely to be a hemorrhage. So 55% of those are actually uh, hemorrhagic strokes. There are uh, arterial ischemic strokes, cerebral venous, sinus thrombosis, intracerebral hemorrhages, and of course subarachnoid hemorrhages, much the same as, as much of this stuff. One bullet I would have you remember is that the subarachnoid hemorrhage is much more common in teenagers. So of all the pediatric stroke syndromes, when you're dealing with teenagers, um, suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there's a, there's a pile of reasons for that, and they're in that book that I want you to read. So please do go through and read the book. The peak age for pediatric stroke is in the first year of life. So why do we say that? Most of them happen in the first year of life. That's when we, we really begin to see the diagnosis of and see children to suffer the effects of things like coarctation of the aorta or if they have barrier aneurysms resultant from that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just not all that common. We wish it didn't exist at all, but uh, it is common enough that we need to study it and understand it for when we're dealing with our pediatric patients. So what are the risk factors for stroke? There are two categories. They are modifiable and non-modifiable. I would know them all if I was going to take an ASLS class. So modifiable ones, hypertension, right? Obvious, diabetes, it weakens blood vessels. Dyslipidemia, right? So anytime there's some sort of malfunction with your lipids, remember you need good cholesterol. You don't need too much of the quote unquote bad cholesterol. Um, obesity, cigarette smoking, anytime there was a prior stroke. Um, why is that modifiable? Because you can get uh, healthcare treatment. You can get uh, medications and things to prevent that. Of course, the counseling of a physician, all those good things. Heart disease, carotid artery disease, hypercoagulable states. If any of you have studied the triad of Virchow, who was the doctor who really did the uh, major groundbreaking work in coagulability within the body, um, and of course it makes it even more amazing, it was done in the 1800s. Um, <clears throat> you, you know about hypercoagulable states. And then of course cocaine or excessive alcohol use because both of these produce hypertension. Um, states of, of profound hypertension at times. So what are some non-modifiable risks? Advanced age, right? Um, we can't help it that we get any older or, well, I'm not even going to say that's a bad joke. Uh, the male gender, we can't help that. Now it is 2019 and there are gender changes going on in this world. And I totally understand that. However, when we talk about base level DNA, there are some things you cannot change in terms of risk factors for medical conditions. Just that's the way it is. Okay. Uh, of course, race, we do see higher levels in the African-American, Hispanic, and Native American population. None of these are attributable to social habits or anything like that. Um, we all vary by uh, our race, our ethnicity, have different things. So if you're Caucasian, you're much more likely to die of cystic fibrosis. Congratulations, right? Um, so that's not really a stab at anybody. And just, just because it's 2019 and everybody's so sensitive about that, I just really wanted to clarify. And then, of course, if you have a family history or of MI or stroke, um, you're, you're very likely to experience one, right? 
So let's talk about what the penumbra is. So this is the actual zone of infarction. Um, it's a zone of reversible ischemia around the core of an irreversible infarction. Remember, ischemia is, is reversible. Infarction is tissue death, right? So the penumbra is usually salvageable, at least to some extent. Um, there's a couple things you can do to really mess it up, though, that you can really make it unsalvageable. The top one that gets its own bullet is that it can be damaged by lowering blood pressure because that's one of the biggest things that is done incorrectly in stroke care. Now, before everybody goes crazy with the comments, yes, I understand the AHA's recommendations about certain levels or lowering blood pressure to a certain point. Uh, who am I to disagree with the AHA? I'm nobody. Um, but when I say lowering, I mean when you have a stroke that is misdiagnosed as a hypertensive crisis and someone gets a tunnel of labetalol or nitroglycerin or an ACE inhibitor, dropping their blood pressure to uh, normotensive levels, severe damage happens in the penumbra when that happens. Um, it can also be damaged by hyperglycemia. So a lot of, you know, those free radicals and the acids and things like that that are made with the overconsumption of sugar. And, you know, of course, dextrose by itself is, is pretty caustic chemical. So we don't really want it all into um, the spot where the brain is bleeding, especially not in a high concentration. Of course, fever, because there's profound hypoxia and cerebral edema that follows things like uh, status epilepticus and all that. And frankly, the brain has enough going on during a stroke. And then fever. Fever is also a problem with that. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up with some stroke mimics. These are things that I would definitely remember and ask questions about as I went through ASLS. So stroke mimics. Hypoglycemia is definitely one. We've covered that. Seizures can also do it, especially certain types of seizure disorders where in the postictal state, the patient can actually have facial droop and paresis. It's pretty wild, but it is, it is out there and you will see it. Migraines can do it. So migraines can definitely uh, show palsies or, or things similar to the palsies of different facial nerves where we can actually see sensitivity to light. We can see neck pain. We can even see facial droop with it as well. And of course, tumors. Tumors have a way of doing their own thing, pushing uh, on certain parts of the brain and putting pressure where it's definitely not wanted. And then, of course, an abscess in the brain can do uh, a lot of damage as well and can mimic a stroke. Again, this is all about pressure and about damage to certain parts of the brain. So it makes sense that a lot of these would mimic some of this. And then trauma, especially in a case where it produces a subdural hematoma. So this can mimic some of the stroke syndromes, especially those of decreased consciousness, seizure, nausea, vomiting, sensitivity to light, all those good things. So that is a very quick rundown of the ASLS cheat sheet. Um, these are all things that are absolutely uh, important that you understand if you want to not just pass the class, but deliver good, you know, stroke life support care. The rest of it can be found in the book, and I would love for you to read it, read every page of it. And when you get done, do it again. All right, get out there and practice.